Hi everyone, my name is Evelyn Callahan and I am a research fellow at the Open University. Uh, I'm Michael Patch, pronouns they them. Uh, I am a researcher at LGBC Foundation. And today we are going to be presenting uh, healthcare experiences of older trans people and disabled and chronically ill trans people in the UK, uh, preliminary findings from the ICTA project. So the ICTA project, or Integrating Care for Trans Adults, is an NIHR-funded project which aims to develop effective models for the health services needed to support trans adults before, during, and after they are seen by gender identity services. Specifically, the focus is on effective integration of care or how to make healthcare more joined up. So through our project, we conducted a screening survey to get a baseline of what people's experiences of healthcare were and to recruit people for our case studies and community interviews. The case studies you will have heard about in a previous presentation from our colleagues, Ben Vincent and Jake Fletcher, uh, but we're gonna be talking about the community interviews. So within those interviews, we have uh, spoken with 91 trans people so far, and these are ongoing as we're still recruiting to certain subgroups in the community. Um, so with these interviews, as we mentioned, there are subgroups that are populations of particular interest that we think will have a noteworthy experience when accessing healthcare as trans people who also experience other forms of oppression. So the two we're talking about today are older trans people and disabled or chronically ill trans people. There are 35 in our older sample and 43 in our disabled sample. The final stage of the project will be producing learning materials for a variety of audiences, including clinicians, uh, mental health professionals, and the trans community themselves. So our findings from our older population, and this is uh, was 50 plus in our particular sample was uh, age between 51 and 82 years of age, as you saw. So uh, we had a few key findings from this group. First of all, uh, was waiting. Of course, this is something that is uh, of concern for all of the people in our sample. It was a, a very wide uh, ranging experience, but there is a particular uh, kind of experience of waiting with our older group. So people being seen for a first appointment at GICs now have been waiting up to five plus years. Now, first appointment does not, uh, there's no care provided at the first appointment. That's just, just to get in the door of the GIC. And of course, people being referred now have been waiting, uh, will have been waiting exponentially longer when they, when they do get seen. So waiting is a huge issue across the population. But it took on an additional urgency for older participants. As one participant explained, I don't know how long I've got, none of us do, but you know, I'm at an age now where I'm looking back more than I'm looking forward. So I would like to think that when somebody of advancing years comes forward and says, look, you know, I've been miserable for the last 59 years, I'd like to live out my life as the person that I really am. They would sit up and say, yeah, okay, we'll do what we can right away. Rather than saying, oh, well, you've got to wait behind all the 18 year olds. They've got another 60 years to live, you know, hang on a minute, that ain't fair. So this participant is expressing, expressing frustration that many of our participants in this group uh, expressed, which was, that they felt that they had already been waiting many years to, uh, to transition to, to you know, live as their authentic selves and that they were being asked to wait even longer and that that, that was quite disrespectful, as well as the, the infantilizing attitude that some felt they were uh, subjected to. They felt that they were old enough to know their own minds and should be able to consent uh, to whatever they, they wished to do uh, for their own bodies. And uh, finally, that kind of urgency of not having enough time left to, to, you know, to enjoy it, to, to enjoy the, the kind of results of the process. Another uh, one of our uh, kind of key findings was with transition-related healthcare, so those kind of specific healthcare services once they were able to access them. So additional considerations for older people taking uh, hormone replacement therapy or HRT, uh, that can include using estrogen patches uh, or gel instead of pills, uh, could be similar with testosterone gel. Uh, instead of shots to decrease the risk of heart disease, stroke, and blood clots. Now, what's really important to note here is that uh, this does not mean that older trans people should not be taking HRT or can't take HRT safely. Uh, they may wish to use these different forms, as I've mentioned, but they may not get along with those different forms as well. And it's all about informed consent at the end of the day. They should be uh, told all of the risks, but HRT is important medication. Uh, so it should be, be valued that way, and they should be able to make the, make the decision for themselves, considering the risks uh, to, about what's the right, what's the best path for, forward for themselves. Uh, additionally, uh, similarly, an increased surgical risk. This is for any surgery, 
the, uh, as you get older, there's an increased, uh, increased risk. But again, that should be up to the individual to make the informed consent themselves. Uh, but some of them were concerned about those risks and, and maybe uh, were selecting not to go through with certain surgeries for that reason. Others felt that they were too old for surgical intervention, not in a medical sense, but in a social sense, uh, in, a, in a kind of personal sense, that there was no point, uh, that they didn't have enough years left uh, to, you know, to enjoy it, to utilize it. Um, you know, for lower surgery, uh, many of them described not being sexually active and not planning to be so, so, so not feeling um, that there was a reason for themselves to, to, to have that intervention. Uh, additionally, hair removal is more challenging on gray and white hair. So that's a consideration for our older population. Uh, and all of these above examples are, are relevant to people transitioning later in life. Some of them, uh, uh, like HRT, are, are ongoing concerns. Um, but our historic transitioners, as well, people who transitioned many years previous, they faced uh, a tertiary care system. So they were not able to get referred directly to the gender identity clinic. They had to be referred through mental health services first. So there was that extra barrier and uh, other barriers that were unique to their uh, historic experience as well. And then finally, non-transition related healthcare. So social care and end of life planning was a chief concern for this group. It's something they were thinking about, something they were worried about, as well as appropriate screening. So in the UK, we have screening programs for several diseases, mainly for cancers. Um, so we have this, this one participant's experience of trying to get a uh, mammogram. Uh, and as he described, I developed this breast abscess and the GP's advice was go and get yourself a mammogram. So I rang breast test whales to get a mammogram and was told that we don't see trans people in this service. And I was actually shocked because I thought they did. I thought they actually ran male clinics, but they don't. So even if you're a man with breast cancer or if you're male identifying, you have to book a mammogram through your local hospital rather than through the breast test people. And it usually takes longer because you're accessing a specialized service because they don't run male clinics very often. So for this individual, this, uh, was actually quite an urgent situation. It was not a routine uh, check. It was actually symptomatic. Uh, they were symptomatic and, and seeking a mammogram. Uh, at the time we had spoken to this person, this incident had happened several months previous and they had to that date not been successful in accessing a mammogram. And this was an ongoing issue for him. So this is, you know, this is very concerning that uh, and a pretty blatant example of, of discrimination uh, in healthcare against this, against this uh, person because of being trans. So our key takeaways for this group are that decreased waiting lists are needed uh, through an informed consent model. Two, that uh, we need to support people tr that are transitioning later in life. That more research into medical transit uh, interventions for older people is needed and a need for appropriate services through the end of life and beyond. So now we're gonna look at some of the key findings from our disabled and chronically ill sample starting looking at their experiences of non-transition related healthcare. Um, so a lot of times there were instances of mistreatment and individuals were unsure whether this was because of transphobia. Um, this was also made more complex as there were more often more healthcare interactions and so there were more possibilities for negative experiences and incompetent care. Uh, a frequent experience was uh, struggling with gendered hospital wards, whether this was um, not being given a choice over the ward which they feel more appropriately reflects their gender or the ward which they feel the safest in. Um, and again, this should always be person-centered and be led by the individual as to where they would like to be placed within a ward. Uh, there were instances of medical trauma as well. So people experiencing um, complete mishandlings of their disability or chronic illness. And there were lastly instances were, uh, quite frequently of self-management of care. So this is where people were having to manage their condition or their multiple conditions and having to be an expert uh, in their own right. In some instances, this meant foregoing some healthcare in order to access others, whether this was because their conditions were related and one needed to be resolved first before the other could, or whether this was because they didn't have the capacity or the energy to manage multiple specialists and manage multiple relationships with others. This ties into transition related healthcare as well, as this for some people was also <clears throat> that they would manage alongside this and a specialist they would manage alongside this. So when looking at transition related care, there are some transition steps that are complicated by conditions. As we mentioned before, with some of the uh, people in the older sample, there are certain uh, risks that 
increase, such as strokes and heart disease. Uh, and these are these will be prevalent in the disabled and chronically ill sample as well. Having a disability or chronic illness can also cause delays or prevent care at every step of the pathway. And that includes the GP referral to the gender identity clinic, which is how people are able to then access care. It can also include referral from the GIC to accessing surgery. So we have a quote here from someone who wanted to get a referral from their GP to their gender identity clinic, but was struggling and was unable to access that. And so in their words, so I literally went to my GP with a list of information for them. So I actually did their job for them, slammed it on their desk and said, right, refer me now unless you want a dead body in 48 hours. And it's this level of extremity that we particularly found disabled and chronically ill trans people are having to go to in order to get the care that they need. So then lastly, looking at the absence of care, which often occurred, uh, this could be focused around a particular condition, whether that was something that was under-researched under and not fully known or supported, uh, or due to a lack of diagnosis in some instances where people would struggle to access diagnoses for conditions. Um, there were also instances of what procedures were accessible to people. So there was one instance where someone couldn't have a uh, sigmoid colonoscopy, vaginoplasty, uh, because that just wasn't uh, available to them due to their uh, IBS. But the procedure that they would want, which was a peritoneal vaginoplasty, isn't available on the NHS system uh, currently. And then lastly, on this point of absence of care, and this kind of ties together the experience of disabled and chronically ill trans people together, is this quote from this one person talking about why they decided at one point in their life to delay a referral to a GIC. So there was at least at peak, I've had seven different specialists, seven or eight different specialists. At the moment, I've only got the two that I've just been signed from, and now I'm back waiting for other specialists. But it's been hell. It's a full-time job, and honestly, I wish I could do anything else. And I think what makes this case even more challenging is that since that incident, they had then gone on to seek a referral to a gender identity clinic only to be denied specifically relating to their disability. And so this is an instance outright where this blocks disabled trans people from being able to access care they need. And so our key takeaways from this are an increased level of autonomy, again, through an informed consent model, supporting uh, support for people exploring transition choices. Again, this is kind of key to the informed consent, making sure that they understand the risks that are there and are supported uh, by services uh, when they make their choice as to what they want to do. And then lastly, more research into how medical interventions uh, can interact with various different conditions for different individuals.